Today we're finally going to tackle a second species exercise. Here's our cantus and the soprano this time. As always, we should sing the cantus in every line we write for that matter, but because this doesn't sit well in my vocal range, I'll spare you all from listening to some really bad singing and play it on the piano. But you should definitely sing it on your own. And before jumping in, I want to make a brief detour to discuss something important that Second Species introduces. For those familiar with only Fuchs, what I'm about to discuss may surprise you. In Second Species, and beyond for that matter, accented passing and or neighboring dissonances can occur. According to the Galon Biche Treatise, which is the treatise all my counterpoint videos are based on, they are allowed if two conditions are met. The first condition being, we must be prolonging the same harmony. So if we take a look at this example, F major is being prolonged. The second condition is, we must eventually resolve our dissonance into some sort of consonance. I say eventually because we don't need to resolve that dissonance immediately. We can pass through multiple dissonances in a row before resolving to some consonance. As long as we arrive at a point of resolution, even if it's in the next bar, we're fine. In this case, the E which creates a dissonance of a fourth resolves immediately to F creating a consonance of a third. This will be useful to us because it will not only add some punch to our harmonies, but it will also allow us to create smoother stepwise lines. As I discussed in my first species video, I often begin a contrapuntal exercise by asking the same question, and that is, where can I create a beautiful musical moment? To recap, a memorable musical moment often creates some sort of harmonic or melodic interest, or both, preferably both. With this in mind, these two measures immediately catch my attention. We have this 5-1 motion in the cantus, which usually implies a very conclusive event, right? Dominant going to tonic, 5-1. But because this isn't the end of the cantus, we know that we can't make it sound too conclusive. We don't want the phrase to sound finished before it's actually finished. So how can we make a seemingly conclusive event sound not that conclusive? There are many ways, but one of the most common and effective ways is through deceptive motion. If we put 5-6 in the bass, we imply a deceptive cadence. In other words, the 5 chord going to the 6 chord, right? The 5 is C, the 6 is D. Not only does this give us a little harmonic surprise by going to the 6 instead of the expected 1, but it also creates a lingering dissonance. Now, I probably sound like a broken record at this point for those that have been watching my videos, but lingering dissonances are usually good. And this lingering dissonance is particularly effective because the tension it creates makes the sound even more inconclusive, as if we still have somewhere to go. And we do. We have four bars left. Now that we have our beautiful, interesting moment, where do we go from there? Well, since we're close to the end, let's just try and fill out these last four bars. Let's look at the bar immediately after with the B flat. Ask yourself, can this B flat belong to the previous chord? Now, I know I said that the bar before this B flat implied a sixth chord, but who's to say it isn't implying a 4-6 chord, a B-flat chord? We haven't revealed the full chord yet, and if we do consider it a 4-6 chord, that means we can potentially prolong this harmony into the next bar, because there's a B-flat there, and have a dissonance secure on the strong beat, which could be very interesting. So I came up with this. These two bars are prolonging a B-flat chord, thus allowing me to have a very dissonant interval of a ninth occur on the strong beat. Now this A is just functioning as a neighboring tone that resolves to the octave, but it's crunchy. Some would even argue, maybe too crunchy. But I chose this for a reason. I'm looking at you performers. This is where knowing counterpoint and harmony becomes invaluable. If you encountered something like this in a piece, you would not want to accent this downbeat. The dissonance itself is already so strong, we don't need to emphasize it. Instead, we should actually lay back here and play more dolce, which will in turn give the dissonance a more melancholic quality. So when performers ask why they should learn this stuff, well, if you don't develop a certain level of harmonic sensitivity, you never notice these things. I often hear interpretations, especially of box music, where performers just blow over and smash through these dissonances at times when they should be laying back and letting the dissonance do the work for them. Moving on, how can we reach our cadence? Well, for one, we know that we must finish on tonic, so let's just write that in. Now, how to get to that tonic, that F? 
As I said in my first species video, always consider the path of least resistance. And in music, that usually means a path consisting of only stepwise motion. So let's try and see if we can climb by step to this F without any problems. For the most part, we can, but we can't continue after this E because it'll give us our F too soon. So what's the missing note that will get us to this F? Pause the video and see if you can guess. Because this bar is implying the dominant C major, leaping down a third to C is really our only option. If we were to go to, say, G, another chord tone of C major, we would imply a 6-4 chord, which isn't allowed. Now some of you may be a bit skeptical, doesn't this create parallel fifths on the weak beats? These are actually not real parallel fifths because D in the previous bar is purely melodic. It has no harmonic weight. Ultimately, it's just a passing tone. When we have perfect fifths occur on the weak beat, but one of the notes involved assumes a purely melodic function, they're perfectly admissible. Let's listen to the whole line and notice how our ear won't even notice those so-called perfect fifths. Now let's work backwards and wrap this realization up. Bar 6 is missing one note, so how do we decide what note to choose? Well, because we wanted to imply deceptive motion from bar 6 to 7, we know that bar 6 should imply the dominant, right? Deceptive motion involves 5 going to 6 most of the time. And if we want to imply the dominant, C major, we really have only one option, and that's having the third E here. Let's consider the path of least resistance. Can we move by step from this E without breaking any rules and backpedal to the preceding bar? Yes, we can. If we do just that, we get a nice stepwise line, G, F, E, where the F functions as a passing tone and the G sounds an imperfect consonance of a third against the cantus. Now let's take a look at this A, the third of F major. In general, whenever you have scale degree 3 in an upper part, putting scale degree 1 against it is often a very good choice. This leaves us with one missing note to complete the bar, and for this missing note I chose A because it allows for a longer stepwise line into bar 6. Now I'm going to jump way back to the first bar. When our counterline is in the lowest part, we have to start on scale degree 1. There's no other option. With that said, which F do we start on? The higher or lower one? Honestly, you have to experiment a bit and see which one can produce the best result. I went with the lower F because it allowed me to explore the lower register of the bass, which sounds great in my opinion. It gives timbral or kestrel variety to the line. Starting on the lower end is a bit tricky. We have two bars, that's only four notes total, to get to the F in measure 4. Due to this, I'm expecting there to be an octave leap involved that will help us get there in such a short time frame. With that being said, since I wanted to explore the bass's lower register, I thought, why not sound the lowest admissible note, this E below the staff? In counterpoint, this is the lowest note allowed for the bass part. If we choose this E, that would mean that our second bar would have to imply some sort of 5-5-6 five, five, chord. There's really no other option. And when I looked in the next bar, I noticed a D in the cantus. D is scale degree 6 in F major. When I realized this, I immediately thought of Bach's Goldberg variations. For those of you who don't know, the progression for Bach's Goldberg variations is essentially built off a 1, 5, 6, 6 progression. Essentially. There's slight variations and stuff, but it's basically that. So I thought, why not just do what Bach did? Can't really go wrong by doing so. If we want to imply some sort of 6 chord here, we would need either a D or an F, which to choose. Again, we would have to work it out, but to save time, Know that D results in the better line. Now how to get to that D from the E in the previous bar? Well remember that octave leap I was expecting? Here's where it's going to happen. We leap the octave, which is then perfectly balanced down a step. And finally, we fill the remaining gap between D and F with an E. And there you have it, a beautiful realized second species exercise. Let's take a listen. I'm pretty proud of this realization, it does a little bit of everything, it explores dissonance, the entirety of the bass's range, it's melodically organic and satisfying, it just works. What's amazing is that Second Species only introduces one extra note, and that already makes things exponentially more interesting. It goes to show, we don't need to do that much to create interest, and I think students, myself included, always try to do way more than we need to, especially when composing our own works. Because of its constraints, Counterpoint teaches us to make choices judiciously. It teaches us to make the most out of what little we have. 
Thanks for tuning in. In the next video, we'll dive into a second species exercise in minor. And don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you can be up to date whenever I put a new video up. Thanks again and see you next time.